Welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. My mission is to inspire, helping you to get through the tough times and live a better, more fulfilling life. On the show, I speak to inspirational people that have come back from rock bottom and also experts that provide you with the tools you need to implement positive changes in your life. Above all, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And here's a little clip of what's coming up next. What I hadn't taken into account was that I was the first person to go down badly with it. Wow. Um, virtually the first to, to really um, be extremely ill with it. And I was in a coma for five weeks. And I was in a hospital for seven weeks. They couldn't wake me out of my coma. I had everything. I had. I was on ventilators, all the stuff they wouldn't do to an octogenarian now because they were just practicing on me. Yeah. And uh, three times they um, rang Luella up. She was in daily contact with the hospital, my wife, and said, um, I'm afraid he's got less than 5% chance of making it through. We don't know. We can't get him out of his coma and he's on a tracheostomy now and he's on kidney dialysis. And even if he does survive, uh, he'll be severely brain damaged. So you probably will give up on him. I clearly remember getting the sun on my face, smelling the flowers and waking up and croaking through my tracheostomy crew. I'm going to live. And that was all filmed actually as it happened. And I am a living example of the healing bar of nature. Robin, first of all, I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast, especially during during the festive season. It's a lovely, lovely setup in here. But yeah, how how's everything going? Very well. I'm staying with my daughter in Whitstable. And uh, as you say, it's a lovely room. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got the fire beside us, which, which you can't see. It's very warm in here. But um, but yeah, a lovely place to, to record a podcast. So thank you very much for having me. And um, Robin, I have to say it's, uh, it's a real privilege to have you on the podcast, actually, um, because you've achieved so much in, in your life. And obviously, you're widely regarded as sort of one of the last great remaining explorers, really, for all that you've, you've achieved in, in that field. And just before we get to your remarkable recovery from coronavirus, I obviously did want to touch on uh, some of your some of your travels, some of your expeditions. But particularly, what I wanted to focus on was if you'd had any particular instances of having to face real adversity or sort of scary moments, anything that you really had to overcome during these travels, because I'm sure there were a lot of moments, but. Are there any that stand out? Because obviously this fits quite nicely with the narrative of what this podcast is all about. And, you know, we could talk for for weeks about all of your travels. So I thought we'd, I would just focus on, yeah, were there any sort of moments that, that stick in your memory of particularly difficult situations that you had to overcome? Well, I think one of the things that uh, sticks in my memory is that a lot of exploration is about solitude. Mm. Um you're just about to go off and travel by yourself. And we were talking about that and saying that there's a particular fizz about solitary travel. And a lot of my early travels, I was alone. Some of them I was with one one other person. But perhaps the scariest of all was when I did my river journey through South America, proved that you could go by river from Caribbean to the South Atlantic, Buenos Aires, from the mouth of the Orinoco to the River Plate, which I was a lot of the time entirely alone then, miles, hundreds of miles from anybody else in my little boat, sleeping on the river bank in scary places. And that was the culmination of lots of solitary travel that I'd done, hitchhiking around Europe at the beginning when I was at university. In those days, you could hitchhike anywhere in Europe. I mean, back in the early 50s, uh, it was a wonderful era. But then traveling in really exploratory conditions and being alone, I think that's really where it gets to you because you do go a bit, barking mad, talking to yourself all the time, singing as you go along. I was in a little boat barreling along these rivers through Central America. Nobody's done it before or since, I don't think, that journey. But wow, um, it was just, it was a sort of silly thing to do, but I wanted to prove it was possible. And so there was the determination to get there that keeps you driving on. And then the fizz for me came from this exquisite fear of being alone, deep in the rainforest, in a hammock, with a mosquito net and hearing all the noises of the forest and thinking that's an elephant coming. No, they don't have elephants in <laughs> Brazil. It isn't an elephant, but it sounds like one. And what the hell is going on? Yeah. And, and, and freezing with fear. I think 
it's not dramatic, but my God, it was scary. Yeah, because you're in such a you're in such a different environment, and there's obviously all all types of different wildlife and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, the list goes on. But very interesting to hear you say that the the solitude was one of the most challenging things, but also at the same time one of the most enriching things. Yes. Um, and I'll have to update you in terms of my own personal experience when I get back from. I look forward to hearing about it. Although I'm not sure they're quite the same as some of the expeditions that that you did. I'll be in the comfort of hostels rather than a hammock in the in the jungle. But um, perhaps there will still be some some parallels there. But, All um, experience is good. Exactly, exactly. But Robin, the next thing that I wanted to, to ask you about, and I know this is incredibly important for you, and that is the charity that you started back in 1969, which is called Survival International, which I believe was set up to sort of protect the rights of, of tribal people around the world and preserve preserve these areas, which, which is obviously um, an amazing cause. But what I really wanted to focus on, which again fits so fantastically with what this podcast is all about, are the series of challenges that you decided to do. I believe when you were 80, you took on sort of, was it six challenges? One eight. of yeah, Eight, sorry, eight, yeah, eight challenges. So one I think was the London Marathon. Another one was a skydive. Another one was climbing the four highest mountains in the UK. These are incredible feats, even just one of them alone. Um, and yeah, I'm just wondering how difficult was it to undertake those challenges? And also, how confident were you in your own ability to be able to do them all at the beginning when you planned it? Because at the age of 80, that's that's some feat. Well, it wasn't really very difficult. I was just suddenly pissed off at being 80 because <laughs> you know, all my life I've, I've looked a bit younger than I was and sort of always seemed younger and fitter and marginally than other people. But suddenly 80, you can't pretend that 80, you're young anymore. Mm -hmm. 80 is bloody old. <laughs> and it just irritated me to be about to be 80 and then being 80, having my 80th birthday. And so I thought I'd do eight silly things just to prove that I wasn't really 80 and that I could still do all that. And um, starting with the London Marathon, which, you know, I really hadn't broken into a trot much since I was <laughs> school. Um, and everybody kept saying, you know, you're going to do serious training. You've got to build up to a quarter marathon, half marathon, and everything. I said, no, what, I, I'll run a bit up and down, just make sure I can do it. And I did a sort of three mile run up and down to our lake at home. Um, and, um, you know, with those testing things to see whether I was doing the right speed and extrapolating that I could actually do a marathon if I bothered to stay doing it. So I thought, why suffer all that training, which is murder, when I, I, I'm going to suffer like hell once and just concentrate on doing that, <laughs> which wasn't very clever. I mean, it breaks all the rules of proper training. It does. But it worked. I mean, it was murder doing it. But one was buoyed up by this incredible atmosphere. Anybody who's done the marathon knows that the, you're, you're carried along by the crowds, have your name on the front, and they're all saying, go, Robin. And then when you got past and it had 80th year on the back, said, wow, 80, go for it. And this is a terrific boost. And it was the morale giving effect of having all these people cheering you on that got me through. I can imagine, yeah. And I think I'm right in saying you did it in 6 hours and 26 Well, I was determined minutes. to beat my son, who was very fit, and, <laughs> uh, uh, soldier and uh, heavy training, for all that stuff. Um, and he was planning to do it in three hours. Mm. So I was aiming to do it in six. Fortunately, he pulled an Achilles tendon shortly before doing it. <laughs> so he did it in 6.20 and I did it in... He did it in 3.20 and I did it in 6.15, so I beat him. Yeah, you beat him. That was the, <laughs> yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. An, an incredible feat, Robin. And yeah, um, interesting to hear sort of how much the crowd willing you on really yeah. really gets you over the line. But I'm wondering in some of the other challenges that you did where perhaps there was no crowd around willing you on, well, what, what keeps you going in, in that moment? Is it the just the pure passion that you have to try and secure you know funds for for the charity which you're so passionate about? Is, is that the why that keeps you going and I think just, you. you know you're going to do it. Look, the, none of them were that challenging. Really. The marathon was, but, you know, climbing the highest four peaks in, in Britain isn't a great mountaineering achievement. And actually lots of people came with me. Yeah. And it was fun. And I always knew I would be able to do it. We had a great guy, um, Joss Shackley, who came to photograph, a wonderful character who climbed most of them, came most of them and did them uh, barefoot and wow. insisted that uh, in return for coming along and taking all the pictures, we all skinny dipped at the top in a, <laughs> in a lake, which is freezing on the top of Snowden and Scarfell and uh, Carantool in Ireland. And uh, 
that was good actually because you felt much better. But I wouldn't have dreamt of doing it otherwise. But he he just made us all and boys and girls. A lot of people came with me. Yeah, and he made everybody strip off and get in and uh, jump in the water. It's a good trip to tip if you're climbing a mountain to do that once you've got to the top. Absolutely. Well, what what a fantastic experience. And I do think, Robin, that you do un- underplay some of these achievements a little bit, because I'm not sure how many 80-year-olds there are out there doing these these kind of things, but fantastic to hear um, that, that you had fun while, whilst doing them. And then, yeah. Robin, the next thing that I wanted to, to transition to, which certainly is the absolute opposite of all of this, um, it certainly was no fun at all and probably um, one of the most difficult things, if not the most difficult thing you've ever been through in your life. And this is obviously your well-documented in the media um, battle with with coronavirus between sort of March and April um, last year, I believe. And I'm wondering if we could just rewind back to the start, really. And if you could talk to us a bit about how did you end up catching it? When did you become aware of it? And how quickly did things become quite serious? Well, I now realise that I've made a mistake. I haven't got a copy of my book with me because I should be holding that up to promoted <laughs> because in February 2020, when people didn't really know what COVID was, they'd sort of vaguely heard about it, I published my 26th book, which was called Taming the Four Horsemen. And uh, it actually has pandemics on the cover. And on page four, I say there is about to be an imminent major pandemic all over the world. Wow. Uh, it's inevitable. It's not a question of of if it's a question of when it's happening, everybody recognised that. That was just a, a result of researching into pandemics. And so I published that on the 14th of uh, February, 2020. And uh, what I hadn't taken into account was that I was the first person to go down badly with it. Wow. Um, virtually the first to, to really um, be extremely ill with it. And I was in a coma for five weeks. And I was in the hospital for seven weeks. They couldn't wake me out of my coma. I had everything I had. I was on ventilators, all the stuff they wouldn't do to an octogenarian now because they were just practicing on me. Yeah. And uh, three times they um, rang Luella up. She was in daily contact with the hospital, my wife, and said, um, I'm afraid he's got less than 5% chance of making it through. We don't know. We can't get him out of his coma and he's on a tracheostomy now and he's on kidney dialysis. And even if he does survive, uh, he'll be severely brain damaged. So you probably will give up on him. Wow. And, uh, they couldn't get me out of the coma, but luckily I was in the only hospital in Britain with a garden attached to the ICU unit, intensive care unit, which um, Derryford in Plymouth. And so they wheeled me out. I was only the second person to be wheeled into this new garden. And um, I remember nothing, fortunately, from the five weeks, except for the hallucinations. And that's another whole story. <laughs> but uh, I clearly remember getting the sun on my face, smelling the flowers, and waking up and croaking through my tracheostomy crew, I'm going to live. And that was all filmed, actually, as it happened. And I am a living example of the healing power of nature. It just worked for me. It got me out of my coma. And uh, they wheeled me in every day from then on. And it, I did physiotherapy and stuff in this fairly scruffy little garden, but it was out in the open air. And it was a little bit of nature. And the the wonderful nurses in in the in the uh, uh, in the hospital who were had looked after me. They need the relief of getting out in the fresh air, and the patients do. And of course, you have to have all the things to plug in because I had tubes in every conceivable orifice, and uh, that all has to be plugged in. And um, so, hospital gardens are quite expensive. So when I came out, barely able to walk and on a Zimmer frame, do a couple of yards. And they let me out and sent me home. Fortunately, they couldn't find an old people's home to take me on. So <laughs> my long-suffering, wonderful wife uh, took me on and, and, yeah. and saw me through and, 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 and cured me. Um, I could do about two yards on my Zimmer frame. Wow. And I was told that it takes a month for every week that you're in intensive care to get healthy again. Came out on the 3rd of May last year. So I said, okay, on the 3rd of October, I will climb Cornwall's highest mountain. It's not very high, but it's quite a challenge when you're like that. Yes. On the 3rd of October, five months from today. And uh, I'll raise over £100,000 for a hospital healing hot garden in Cornwall's hospital, Trelisk, because we hadn't got one. And anyway, I did. The timing was perfect. I couldn't have done it a week before probably, but I was just about well enough with the BBC crew all filming in the wettest day since records began with a 70 mile an hour 
gale. It was Storm Alex that was going through. And uh, we got to the top, filmed it all, and I've raised over 120,000, and the healing garden in Cornwall is now happening. Wow. But what it taught me was that this rather uh, vague idea, which I talk about in the book, of the healing power of nature, is suddenly being taken very seriously, partly because of COVID and partly because of an awareness of um, climate change. And, and extraordinary things have happened in the last two years. The whole consciousness of nature has actually changed. And a lot of stuff which was regarded as very wacky, backy country for bearded people with sandals to talk about <laughs> um, is now being taken very seriously by scientists and it's becoming mainstream. Um, the Japanese have a word for it. Um, they sort of invented the concept about 30 or 40 years ago and call it Shinrin-yoku, uh, forest bathing. It doesn't mean taking your clothes off and getting wet, but it means going out into the forest and sitting under a tree and feeling better. And everybody sort of has known that a good walk in the countryside makes you feel better, but nobody's really analyzed it or taken it very seriously as a scientific pursuit. Hmm. And we are, what is really doubly exciting for me is that having survived against all the odds and apparently got most of my marbles still intact, <laughs> um, my son, who has taken the farm over and is foresting the whole place now and changing it all, um, and we have some uh, temperate woodland on the farm, which is now suddenly recognized as very rare and very rich. And he is turning it into a therapy center for people who just need to feel better or have got mental problems or uh, want to do yoga or meditation or whatever and walk in the woods. And believe it or not, the p timing is impeccable on all this. Yeah. Scientists of the utmost fame from Loughborough University and Exeter University are all coming down and actually studying the different therapeutic effect that different trees can have if you go and sit under them. This is wow. mind-blowing stuff. Yeah. Uh, that it's real and it's happening. And uh, to equate that with the fact that it, I'm a living example of it working is kind of weird, and strange and exciting for me. Absolutely. And <clears throat> there is so much to break down there, uh, that story from, from start to finish. And just before we get back to the healing power of nature, which is something that I really do want, want to go into, um, because some of the stuff you said there was just fascinating. Um, and as you say, you know, um, if you'd said this to someone, you know, a couple of years ago, they'd probably look at you like, like you were yep. mad, but you're a living example of it. I mean, this idea that you can sit under a tree and it could have therapeutic benefits for you, is just, it seems, it seems unbelievable, but obviously there is something to it. And obviously you're, you're a living example of the healing power of nature. But I just wanted to rewind uh, back to the moment before you were sedated and, and put in a coma, Robin, you were obviously incredibly ill. Were there moments when you yourself thought you weren't going to make it? Or did you always have this inner belief in you that, that you were going to, to conquer it? Interesting. Bit mm. of both. Mm. Um, I don't remember... The human brain is wonderful. It's wiped out all the indignities and the pain and the discomfort of, of, of all those weeks I was having disgusting things done to me. Yeah. All that's gone. But I was having an awful lot of drugs pumped into me. I mean, really fierce stuff. And the result of that is hallucinations. Yeah. And surprisingly, I remember those very, very clearly. Wow. Um, and... Unusually, I wasn't scared by them mm. because I've seen so many shamans uh, entering the spirit worlds through taking very powerful drugs, um, sometimes as hallucinogenic snuff up their noses with the Yanomami or ayahuasca or whatever um, in South America and indeed in Southeast Asia. That for me, when it, when I was experiencing it myself, and I, 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 I've been rather good, I didn't indulge because it's actually rather irresponsible to, to take stuff if you haven't had a lifetime's training of being a shaman. Um, you know, you blow your mind and, and it, you may not recover. So I, I've been fairly wet about that. I never did it myself. <laughs> but I watched other people doing it. And so when it happened to me, it was, it was almost familiar Mm. And I could realize that I was becoming the spirit animal and that when all these weird things happened, like snakes crawling over my bed and bats climbing up my saline drip wow. and a big cats walking past that I could reach out and stroke, instead of being scared, I thought, this is really interesting. I'm now in the spirit world and I'm joining 
my friends, the shamans, who I've watched doing this. And, and the spirit world was very real for me. It was in concentric circles around me, I suppose, uh, with a little wicked gate that I could go through to move into other ones. It all sounds wacky, but it was clear, and I remember it totally. Wow. And interestingly, you've triggered another memory with your question. Um, I felt all-powerful at some point. There was one spirit world I moved into where I could switch it all off. And I remember thinking, you know, the world is such a mess that, frankly, you know, it's over. Let's just turn it off. Wow. And I thought, I'll give it another chance. And actually, I was giving myself another chance because if I'd probably turned that way, I would have gone. Mm. And I was pretty close to that anyway. So, yes, it, it, there were times, but there was also, and people are kind enough to say that, you know, I've got a strong will to live and a strong spirit and all that. And I don't know how true that is. But I do believe that a determination not to give up gets you through. Absolutely. And there was a bit of that in, in, in my case as well. But mainly, I was incredibly lucky. I am incredibly lucky that I have no after effects long COVID, not really. And also that I was looked after by wonderful nurses. And then that my amazing wife nursed me through the next five months yeah. and, and actually brought me back to sanity and health. Wow, those hallucinations really sound pretty powerful and, and pretty intense, but it's so interesting to to know that actually your your travels and having met these shamans and that that actually gave you some familiarity, helped Absolutely. you understand what was happening and and in some way become a pilot in these hallucinations and, yep. and be able to choose which way you wanted to go. And that was um to to live, which is fantastic. And um and yeah, you mentioned there that um your wife was uh, was very key in sort of nursing you you back to full health, and that was another Another thing that sort of I felt you almost breezed over slightly was the the the, the period between coming out of hospital and then um, and then climbing the the mountain in in Cornwall. Just how tough was that period of of physical recovery? Well, she's quite bossy, <laughs> and, and, and and these we had wonderful physio ladies, girls who came and talked to me, and and gave me pathetic little exercises to do, which, you know, put one foot in, one foot out, one foot in, one foot out, do that a hundred times. It's actually quite hard after you get to about 70 or 80. Mm. Um, and and they, they gave me these little exercises and Lola kept me up to the mark and made me do it. Yeah. And just reassured me that I would get through. And that's hugely helpful, having the confidence. I was very lucky in, in that respect of having somebody who, Never considered that I would wouldn't make it. Yeah. Uh, whereas um, I could have got depressed and sunk into depression and believed that it was because it's boring. Not being well is very boring. Because I came out when I recovered consciousness in the garden, and then a couple of weeks later left the hospital. I felt absolutely fine inside myself, and I couldn't believe that when the physios asked me to do a silly little exercise like throw a ball. <laughs> But it went all over the place. Oh, this is ridiculous. I can do that. <laughs> so I needed the stimulus of a strong wife telling me, go on, you go, time you did your... And some, my brother-in-law lent me an exercise bike, which, of course, he bought and never used, yeah. like everybody does with exercise bikes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I, I, I did my 20 minutes on that and every day, and, 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 and she just kept me up to the mark and made me, saw me through it, and, and it worked. Yeah. And, and I really am so jolly lucky because so many people have got terrible effects, particularly the young, younger people, surprisingly, are suffering from long COVID much more. And apart from a bit of fatigue, which could be the fact that I'm now 85, yeah. it might help. Yeah. Um, apart from feeling quite tired and having a nap after lunch, um, I, uh, I'm fine. That's fantastic. Obviously, yeah, extremely pleased to hear that. And yeah, I think, you know, initially, so when I was watching the BBC documentary, yeah. which I recommend everybody watches, it's on, uh, you can find it on, on on your website. And so when, you know, you see you coming out of hospital on the Zimmer frame and this idea is conceived that in no time at all, you're going to climb Cornwall's mountain. There is There was part of me watching that thinking, this is now just, this is totally mad. You know, this is, you need to rest and recover. However, and this is actually something that I can relate to myself in, in a different kind of way. Although it was an incredible challenge and, and very difficult, actually, in some way, it saved you from getting down in the dumps yeah. because you had something to train for. Got to have a challenge. Exactly. You've got to have a challenge. And also it took you outside because yeah. you you started doing some walks and then longer walks in order to prepare for it, um, which again kind of brings us back to yeah. the power of nature. Um 
And again, this is something that I can relate to because it helps me massively whenever I'm feeling a bit down mm. or whatever. Um, going out running in the countryside where I live is 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 massively is massively helpful and and more so I think than going and sitting on a treadmill. Not sitting, sorry, going and running on a treadmill in a gym. You know, there is something about being out in nature that helps. Um, absolutely. Um, so, what is the What's the aim, Robin, for this um, this retreat that you now have down at your farm in in Cornwall? Is the aim to sort of bring bring some scientists in and do studies there and sort of be a sort of pioneer in in this uh, new type of research, which is the the impact of of nature and and its healing properties? Well, that's very much part of it mm. because we realise now that we are the guardians of a very fragile and very rich ecosystem, this last vestige of temperate rainforest. I mean, this is a 4,000-year-old wood, Mm. which happens to be on a very rough bit of ground, which I resisted the temptation over the years from agricultural advisors to put bulldozers in and clear it and get a bit more farmland and left this bit of supposedly useless stuff, which is now regarded as priceless. Mm. That's part of it. And we've got rare Cornish black bees and Cornish... um, Lopier pig and other species, beavers we've got, and we're going to introduce other more exciting things to try and recreate the original forest that Britain had. But much wider than that, um, the, the whole new agricultural system, and I've lived through 60 years of trying to make a living on a rubbish hill farm on Bodmin Moor <laughs> um, with the common agricultural policy, which was giving you funding to produce more And I said over the years that this actually wasn't right and it would change. And now we have ELMS, Environmental Land Management, which has been brought in, which has replaced the common agricultural policy and which is about being subsidized for conservation rather than for production, which is the whole change. And this may mean what it's beginning to show and happen is that a lot of Britain will get forested as it used to be, because we're the least forested country in Europe, just wow. about. And uh, although it, some of Britain is beautiful and wonderful, um, we need to reforest a lot. And this is going to be a revolution in agriculture, and it's very exciting. And one of the ways that people will be able to earn money as farmers or landowners um, will be by the therapeutic effect of people enjoying the new forests and, and areas that they can go and stay in, wow. which is what they're doing with our therapy center, with with the old barns that have been done up now beautifully with wonderful showers and those underfloor heating and a whole area for doing yoga in and uh, and practicing. And and Merlin, our son, is is it and his wife are very, um, very good at doing this because he was in the army and served three tours in Afghanistan and saw a lot of people suffer from PTSD. Indeed, he suffered from it himself, but he saw some pretty awful stuff. And so he's very aware about the um, the mental health that's needed. Uh, a lot of people need, indeed, people who just are, are stuck in towns and never get into the countryside suffer the same way. So I think there is a huge opportunity for places like this. They're at the sort of cutting edge of it, um, really doing foraging weekends and and uh, yoga and retreats and, and, and gongs and bells and meditation and uh, forest bathing and all those things, which is pretty intense. Mm. But you can do it at a very gentle level at all. As you say, just going for a walk is the difference. And they're now discovering, and, and as, as you say, it was wacky backy country not long ago, <laughs> but now people are, and some of us have been banging on about it for years, that having just a picture of a tree on the wall of the ward makes people heal sooner or being able to look out of a window and see a tree rather than a blank wall Mm. helps. And going back to forest bathing and the whole question of going and sitting under a tree and feeling better, what the scientists are actually doing, and this really blows your mind, Mm. is that they're actually looking at the um, the, the, the microbes and, and, and the microbial activity that comes from a tree to assess the different therapeutic properties that come from different trees. Wow. I mean, this is extraordinary. And they're taking this very seriously. Yeah. You know, finding out whether if you suffer from depression and you sit under a pine tree, you'll feel better. But if it's migraine, maybe an oak tree does it. Or maybe if it's it's, uh, some other ailment that you've got or you're feeling mental illness, that other trees will work. And, And this works because what happens, and this is scientific stuff, 
that um, there are things called terpenes, which I don't really understand it because I'm not a scientist. But we all know how um, uh, it, it works that uh, leaves on trees um, uh, absorb carbon dioxide and exude oxygen. But they don't just exude oxygen. They have all sorts of molecules within the oxygen, which are what you smell. It's the basis of all sense. Right. And also the basis of this whole question, millions upon millions of very small little things which we inhale. Suddenly we're very aware of all this, wearing masks with COVID. Absolutely. And being told, mm. suddenly this is serious. You mm. know, you cough and we've got the advertisements on television showing all those little stuff. Every breath you take, every hour that you're breathing out, you breathe something like 35 million microbes out, which is vast amount of stuff. And this is beginning to revolutionize medical attitudes towards health. Wow. But instead of saying, well, you know, if you're feeling, ra we've found in the past that giving you some of these medicines helps. We don't really know why. Now, in, in the future, people are going to be able to analyze your breath and find out everything about you. They can already do this. They can tell whether you're a lumberjack or a or a uh, sailor as, as in your previous uh, existence. Wow. They can tell it from your breath. They're beginning to be able to tell all this, where you grew up, which country you're in, and all that stuff. Yeah. And this, for diagnostic reasons, is going to make, it's going to revolutionize medicine and agriculture in the same way. There's, it's, it's all sorts of incredibly exciting things are happening. Absolutely. It is, it's incredibly exciting. And I'll be honest, it's kind of blowing my mind, really, because yeah. it's so exciting, this idea that something that just grows outside that isn't pharmaceutical at all can have such profoundly positive uh, benefits. And um, obviously you're a living example of that and fascinating to hear that, you know, your son was in was in the military and served tours in Afghanistan. And obviously he's heading up this project, which says that he believes in it firmly and it's probably helped him as well. Yeah. So they're, they're already two, two concrete examples. And, and as you say, there's, you know, the scientific data is now coming out to, to back it up. So it's, um you know, watch this space, I guess, for what, what more studies come out and and is it open now for people to visit people yes. can go down opening in march opening they're, they're, in march they're, they're changing their bell tents this year okay uh, which get a bit damp in cornwall because it rains a lot so they're yeah. now putting up a-frame yeah. uh, little huts which will be warm with it with a uh, a wood burning stove in them right okay wonderfully luxurious and comfortable and exciting and it's kabila cornwall absolutely yeah so it's not roughing it there are the fantastic amenities there it's very comfortable and but you're you also can, in nature and it leads straight into these ancient woodlands which you can go down and and uh, experience the wonders of the woodland Fantastic. from your little house. Amazing. And we'll, I'll be sure to leave a, a link in the description, not only to some of your books, but also uh, the link to, to that as well, so that people can have a look and and see if it's, if it's something for them. And Robin, I'm, I'm curious if in, obviously your whole life, you've been traveling to incredibly sort of rich areas of the world in terms of, in terms of nature and on, on your expeditions. And I'm wondering if perhaps so much exposure to that throughout your life has kind of given you a, a you know, um, has served you well in your, in, in your older years in terms of keeping you young and fresh, perhaps all along it has been this sort of healing power of nature, keeping you young and fresh. I don't know. Do you think there's any, any sense in that? Well, I think I, I really couldn't comment on that. <laughs> you could say that I couldn't possibly comment. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I think also spending a lot of time with different tribes mm. and tribal people. Um, I mean, I've lived with or stayed with or visited or sometimes for a long period, sometimes for very short, uh, over a hundred different cultures and tribes around the world. Wow. Tribal people from remote hunter-gatherers, barely contacted people to very sophisticated tribes. Um, and seeing the different way that, or the not so different way, the way we all viewed nature for the first 200,000 years of our evolution until the very brief moment since we got settled agriculture and stopped being hunter-gatherers. And those that still are in that association with nature have a lot to teach us in how to live, how to keep sane, how to associate with nature. So a lot of that must have rubbed off on me. And I think that's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. I'm sure. I'm sure it's had a profoundly positive effect on your life in, in, in many different ways, those incredibly uh, rich and, and cultural experiences. And um, Robin, now I wanted to look towards the, the future. Can, can we expect any more fundraising efforts, any more challenges that you want to take on? Um, or are you very comfortable now having done so many of them? Or is there 
a desire to do more. I don't know. Give us a break. Yeah. I'm, 85. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to stop. I am writing two more books, two new yeah. books simultaneously at the moment, one yes. fiction and one nonfiction. Yes. And it's rather fun. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people who always has at least half a dozen books that I'm reading at the same time beside my bed. Right. Um, and I, I like the sort of spread of that. And, and I rather like the fact that I'm, um, when I sit down on my computer, I, I can decide which book I'm going to do a bit of work on. Mm. So I have a bit more to give yet. But I think uh, it becomes slightly undignified in your old age to go on doing the physicals. No. And also, uh, it's becoming, sadly for the next generation, rather unacceptable now for, to go on long haul flights, mm. just because you want to go and do something that's fun at the other end. I lived through a wonderful Goldilocks era when it was not considered Nobody had thought of it as a bad thing to no. be using the internal combustion engine to fly halfway around the world in order to spend a bit of time in a rainforest. Mm. Unfortunately, I think we're now coming into an era where people are going to have to be much more careful about doing that um, until we have electric aeroplanes and it's all right. And that's happening. I mean, that won't be long before you'll be able to have short haul flights already with with, with uh, uh, non-polluting aircraft. And I think the, the day will come again when it will be acceptable to do that. But I think for me to go hacking and hewing through forests rather slowly now uh, <laughs> is is uh, not really on. No, absolutely no. And you've 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 done more than enough in in your lifetime. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you've completed. So I'm many. off the hook. Exactly, yeah. you're absolutely off the hook, Robin. It's been um, it really has been an absolute privilege uh, to chat to you. I've had uh, I've really enjoyed this chat. It's one that I've learned a lot from as well. Uh, some of that sort of nature and healing stuff is certainly stuff that I hadn't thought about before. So yeah, it's been enjoyable and also a learning experience. But Robin, one way that I finish off all of the podcasts, they're all finished off in the same way, is by asking guests who are from all different walks of life if they have any parting bits of advice or things that have helped them throughout their lives, whether it's ways of thinking or whatever it might be, um, things that have helped you through your your hardest, your toughest moments that listeners might be able to, to learn from. So yeah, did you have any final parting bits of advice that, that listeners might be able to take something from? Well, I think in the context of what we've been talk about, talking about, yeah. I really can't say anything else except go for a walk in the woods. Yes. Um, yeah. Just go and experience nature. Breathe in the wonders of nature and, and realise just how rich this planet that we live on is and that every teaspoonful of soil has more life forms in it than there have been people on the planet wow. throughout history. And they have thousands of miles, thousands of miles of, of these minuscule mycorrhizomes, threads that, that, that talk. Through. That's right there. You go out into a field, take a handful of earth and just look at it and realize that the whole of the universe is in a handful of soil. And, and don't look outwards to this nonsense of outer space, which some self-indulgent billionaires are now spending obscene sums of money suggesting that we're all going to go and escape and live in Mars. That is a fallacy. Who wants to live in a space suit no. with a nappy for the rest of your life? I mean, it's, it's, it's obscene and, and silly. Mm. Exploration is very alive. And, and the, the world, this fascinating planet we live in, really isn't understood yet. So my advice is, if you want to clear your mind, try and find some open space to go and walk in and sit in the open air. And that's what I think this agricultural revolution that's coming will make it easier for everybody to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that will be a good thing. Absolutely. No, I think that's a fantastic bit of advice. And I think, you know, nowadays with screens and Netflix and social media and um, living in cities, it's people are sort of ignoring nature more and more. And perhaps that's why we're seeing higher instances of mental illness and various other various other things. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and as I've said before, it's something that's that's helped me throughout my life, getting outdoors, getting in the fresh air. And, and I know it's helped a lot of friends also that have suffered from various different mental illnesses and uh, and whatever else it might be so yeah there is absolutely a lot of sense in that and um yeah to finish off i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time robin it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you that's it for today's episode i hope you liked it or found it useful if you did make sure you hit subscribe it really helps the channel out and also that way it makes sure that you never miss an episode if you've got a story you want to share on the back on track podcast get in touch give me a shout i'd love to hear from you via back on track pod at gmail.com.